Turn to Psalm 32. This is the song David wrote to teach all of us who have ever transgressed how to get our song back. How to be singing the song because our soul has been set free from sin. Now, his personal testimony is Psalm 51, but that's just his testimony. Psalm 32 is teaching others how they can get their song back, and it's wonderful. And this morning, I just want to show you the points of this psalm, and then next time we're going to go through it piece by piece, because this is, this is one of the most powerful teaching tools I've ever seen, and I have just spent so much time this week just learning about how beautifully God, through David, number one, portrays forgiveness. Number two, portrays the horrors of sin. And then shows how we can get back into God's presence. Let, let me just sketch it. And if you're a, a, a Bible underliner, I, I just want to give you the wide strokes. Because this psalm, marvelously, David has four distinct sections in it. Number one, David sings in verses one and two with delight when his sins were cleansed. And, and that's about as far as we're going to get this morning, and I hope that, that the Lord's table, when we look at it, will be a song of delight from your heart to God because your sins are cleansed and that you know that. And so David says in verses 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in, in whose spirit there is no guile. You know what that is? That's his song of delight. He says, Yashere, that's the Hebrew word. You know what it means? It says the multiplied blessedness. can't get it in one English word. Those Hebrews spoke in pictures. And he says, the blessings are just multiplied for one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered, whose sins are not imputed to them, and in whose spirit there's no guile. Secondly, he says this, look at verse 3. David sings, about his despair when his sins were concealed. He says, don't ever cover your sins. It'll bring you to the point, as it did to me, of near destruction. Look what he says in verse 3. When I kept silent, when I wouldn't look up to you, God, when I wouldn't say, I'm the man, I'm the sinner, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groanings all day long. He said, I could keep up the outward appearance. But inside, I was wasting away. I was groaning on the inside, he said. Verse 4, for day and for night, your hand was squashing me. My vitality was turned to the drought of summer. And then he says something. You know what selah means? It means, hey, look at this. That'd be a way to put it in English. But, you know, the Hebrews, what they, they just stopped everything. They said selah. You know what that means? Did you catch that? Did you see the point? And what he said is, when you sin, if you're in God's family, he'll convict you. And David said he did. He says, God sent me conviction. But he keeps going. Look at verse 5. Because first, in verses 1 and 2, he sings with delight because his sins were cleansed. But verses 3 and 4, he's teaching us that you have despair when your sins are concealed. But thirdly, in verses 5, 6, and 7, he sings of the deliverance he knew when he confessed his sins. And, and how wonderful it was. His deliverance came. And he sings of deliverance of confessed sins. Listen to this song of deliverance in verses 5 through 7. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you. Then he uses another word. My iniquity I haven't hidden. And then he uses another word. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then he uses another Hebrew word. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And then he says it again. He puts a big, bold underline, Selah. You know what he says? When you confess, it pleases God. When you sin, it grieves God and he convicts you. But when you confess, it pleases God. And his song of deliverance says, confess your sins. In verse 6, he continues. He says, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You're my hiding place. You'll preserve me from trouble. You'll surround me with songs of deliverance. Wow. He says it again. Selah. He says, stop everything. Look at this. He says, God sends conviction when we confess. 
He'll give us back our confidence that we can come into his presence. He says, God delivered me. He said, I'm not afraid of anything anymore. He said, before I was afraid of everything. Here's the last part of this beautiful psalm. Look at verse 8. Fourth stanza of his song. The first stanza was a song of delight. He sang about his sins being cleansed. The second stanza, verses 3 and 4, was a song of despair about the horror of concealing his sins and what it did to his insides and his spirit. Stanza 3 was a song of deliverance. When he confessed his sins, they just disappeared. They're underneath the blood of Christ. Fourth stanza, David sings about his desire that those sinful ways be crushed and not come back. He said, I, I don't like that. I don't want that to happen again. No, not that. You know, little children are so, so sweet. Little Jeremiah, he was here in the office yesterday helping me, and he stood up. I said, don't stand up in that chair. He stood up in the chair, and it fell over. Scared him to death. That great big stuffed chair fell over. And his eyes always get this big, and he says, not do that again. <laughs> you know, that's David. I can see David saying, not do that again. He said, that's too bad. That's horrible. And look what he says in verse 8. He says, my desire is my sinful ways. Not do that again. Crush them, God. I'll instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I'll guide you with my eye, God said to him. Now, did you know the ultimate of parenting? You don't have to say anything. Just look at him. If you look at him, go. If you look at him, go. They, they're guided with the eye. You don't have to say a word. They can tell by looking at you. And, you know, a child is trained. Whenever they're in doubt, they'll always look back. And, you know, if they're a rebel, they'll look back and they'll, and they'll do it anyway. And there's a lot of rebellion in all of us. But if you train them enough, they'll look at you and get the message and say, okay. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, God, I want to, you to guide me with your eye. And I'll tell you what, eye contact doesn't work if you're not looking or if you're so far away. I mean, I can't guide anybody with my eye that's in Pennsylvania or in California. They've got to be real close. And what he's saying is, I'm going to stay so close to you, God. I want you to crush these sinful ways. I'm not going to get out of sight. And I don't want you to get out of my sight. And I want you to guide me with your eye. I'm going to look at you. And if you go, I don't want to do it. You see, he's had such a tender heart. Verse 9, don't be like the horse or the mule. They don't have any understanding. They have to be harnessed with bit and with bridle, else they will not come near you. Verse 10, many sorrows will be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy surrounds him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. David sings of his desire that his sinful ways be crushed.